Good evening. I thank you for having me here this evening. And I think it's very, very important that we clearly understand that political questions often have a moral content. They're often questions that deal with justice or with ways to wage peace. And <clears throat> clearly, when you look at the scriptures, you discover very quickly that Jesus had a strong commitment to speak about justice and to act for justice. And so I thought that as a beginning or opening, I just set a little framework uh, showing how this idea of speaking and acting for justice comes right out of the gospel. And I refer especially to St. Luke's gospel <clears throat> because it's so very clear there. In, in the uh, third chapter of Luke's gospel, he describes Jesus being baptized. And then immediately after that, going into the desert for 40 days, 40 nights of prayer, communion with God, and confronting evil. You remember the temptations happen when Jesus is making that long retreat in the desert. And he has to reject the concepts of the world, the powers of, of earthly powers and, uh, that are evil, and he rejects Satan. And then after he um, spends that time in the desert, Jesus comes back to Nazareth, to the town where he grew up. And he goes into the synagogue on Saturday, or the Sabbath day, this is in the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel. And I have a sense that because he'd been away for a while, <laughs> the leader of the synagogue said, why don't you read today? And so Jesus was chosen to be the lector. And it's very important to notice that St. Luke tells us Jesus took the scroll from the leader of the synagogue and carefully unrolled it till he found the place he was looking for a particular text. And he went to the 61st chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And that's a passage that you've heard many times, I'm sure. And maybe we've heard it, it's maybe almost too familiar. We let it go right past us. That's the passage where the prophet cries out, the Spirit of God is upon me. And God sends me to proclaim good news to the poor to heal the brokenhearted, to give the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, and to proclaim God's year of favor, a jubilee year, which means a year when all debts are forgiven, when wealth is redistributed so that everyone has a chance for a full human life. Those are the words of the prophet, and Jesus read those words in that synagogue. And when he finished the reading, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the leader of the synagogue, and sat down. And Luke says, all eyes were fixed upon him. And then he spoke. And he said, this day, this scripture passage is fulfilled even as you listen. What is Jesus saying? Obviously, he's saying it's fulfilled in me. God has sent me to do all of this, proclaim the good news to the poor. They'll be poor no longer in the reign of God, to heal the brokenhearted, those who are suffering, give the blind new sight, open their eyes to see the mysteries and the goodness of God. Set the downtrodden free. That is, break those yokes of injustice. Those who are bound up by injustice, by evil, are to be freed. And God's year of favor, the time when everyone has the opportunity for a full human life. The reign of God, that's what Jesus is talking about. And he says, it's fulfilled in me. That's his mission, obviously, to make all of that happen. And of course, it wasn't to be done by him in a very short time. 
that he lived here on earth. He gathered a community of disciples, people like us. He called them, be my disciples, come follow me. Take up my work, proclaim the good news, make the reign of God happen. That's where we get our call to act for justice, to carry on the work of Jesus, to transform our world into as close an image of the reign of God as possible. That's what Jesus came to do. And proclaim that good news, begin it, and then call disciples to carry it on. So every one of us, if we're a follower of Jesus, we share in that mission to transform our world into the reign of God. We got a long way to go. <laughs> you know, it's 2,000 years since Jesus stood up in that synagogue and said those powerful words. You wish, I suppose, all of us do that. Why couldn't he snap his fingers and just make it all happen all at once? I don't know, it's part of the mystery, I guess, but he didn't. He called disciples to carry on his work. And as I say, we're a long way from having a situation in our world that in any way resembles what Jesus intends to happen, the reign of God. I'll, I'll give you some statistics, some numbers, just to show you how much work we have to do. You know, think of the world, six billion people. One-fifth of those six billion people have 87% of the world's wealth and resources. One-fifth of the world's people. And basically, it's mostly the Christian Western nations of Western Europe and the United States and Canada. Now Russia is included in what we call the group of eight, but it's mostly the Western Europe, Canada, United States, and Russia. Japan would be included. But of those eight nations, most of them come out of a Christian tradition. And we have 87% of the world's wealth. That means, of course, the rest of the people on the planet divide up the other 13%. And when you get to the bottom fifth of the world's people, they have 1.7% of the world's wealth and resources. And of course, there are people who are in absolute poverty absolute poverty. That's a very important term. The first one I know that began to use that term was Robert McNamara when he became head of the World Bank. And for the first time he traveled in parts of the world where people had nothing. And he talked about, he called it absolute poverty. He said it's a situation where people are barely surviving on the margins of human life, a situation so degrading, you cannot call it human. Over one billion people are in absolute poverty. And numbers often are very, well, abstract. They are abstract. Uh, numbers just an abstraction. And so when I say one billion people, I don't think it affects us very much. But if I show you this picture, I don't know if you can see it all the way in the back. It's a very powerful photograph that appeared on the cover of Time magazine a number of years ago. It shows a tiny girl who was in a food line to get a bowl of very thin soup and dropped out of the line and there's a vulture behind her waiting for her to die. See, that's absolute poverty. It's so degrading. 
You can't even call it human. No child should be abandoned like that. And yet over one billion people on our planet are in absolute poverty. Now, tragedy about this picture is that a few months after it was published, the photojournalist who took the picture committed suicide. He had become so depressed because people attacked him. <laughs> they, they, they said, well, instead of taking a picture, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you pick up the little girl? See, and they just don't understand. He was in a situation where there was an overwhelming number of people like that. You couldn't pick them up and take them home. They're bound to die in abandonment like this. No one there except a vulture. That's absolute poverty. That should not exist in this planet. We have more than enough resources so that every person could have a full human life. We all have a right to food, water, clothing, shelter, health care, education. Those are the things we need to become full human persons. And every person on this planet has a right to that. God intended that the resources be for all and not just for a few. But we have a situation in the world where a few of us have almost all of it. And the majority of the people struggle along in poverty or die in absolute poverty. <coughs> That's not the reign of God. It's not what God intended for this planet. And so those of us who have have to begin to ask why. Why are some of us with so much and so many with so little? It's not, again, it's not because there aren't enough resources. No, it's, there are enough. It's because some of us have taken too much to ourselves. And the tragedy is that in the present circumstances, when we talk, when I talked about the one-fifth of the world's people that have most of the world's wealth, those eight nations, we call them the group of eight. They dominate the international economic order. They set the rules. They make the laws. They set the public policies for the nations of the planet. And it works in such a way that the wealth moves from the poor to the rich. See, not only do we have this terrible situation of such disparity, but it gets worse year by year. 1960, the gap between the rich and the poor was 30 to 1. And that was, the United Nations said, that decade of 1960, that decade was to be the decade of development. And in the church, we wrote the document on the church and the, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, in which the bishops of the world taught us about involving ourselves in the world and changing the world. Pope Paul VI wrote a document on, called on the development of peoples. And there were, the Synod of 1971 wrote a document on justice in the world. We began to address the problem. But that decade of the 60s did not begin a reversal. It's gotten worse every decade since. Now the gap between the rich and the poor is more than 70 to 1. It's far worse than it was. Why does that happen? Well, in 1971, as I mentioned, Pope Paul VI called together a, a synod of bishops. This is a mechanism that came out of the Second Vatican Council whereby it, it was an attempt to sort of continue the work of the council where all the bishops of the world gathered, but you can't do that every three years. But Paul VI devised this mechanism of the synod whereby representatives of every nation, 
every bishop's conference in the world came together, you would end up with maybe 250 to 300 people, bishops from around the world, rich and poor and so on. And in 1971, Paul VI said, study the question of justice in the world. Because he had become very concerned about justice in the world and could see that it was not happening. And so the bishops gathered, and here is part of their, their discussion, what took place during that session. They said, they asked this question, how is it after 80 years of modern Catholic social teaching? We're talking 1971, 80 years since 1891, when Leo XIII published the first of what we call the modern Catholic social encyclicals. His was Rerum Navarum, on the rights of laboring people. That was the first of the modern Catholic social teaching. So here it is, 80 years later. How is it, after 80 years of modern Catholic social teaching and 2,000 years of the gospel of love, 2,000 years ago, Jesus had come. How is it that the church has to admit her inability to make more impact upon the conscience of her people? This is not to say that Catholic works of mercy have not been immense, nor that the flame of charity does not burn unquenchably in the breast of thousands upon thousands of religious and laity who give their lives to the service of the poor, the aged, the sick, the orphaned, the forgotten. It's true, over those 2,000 years, the community of disciples of Jesus have been engaged in acts of mercy, acts of love, reaching out to the poor, as the, the aged, the sick, the orphaned, the forgotten. But, and this is a very important point, the bishop stressed again and again that the faithful, that is, the community of disciples, all of us, particularly the more wealthy and comfortable among them, simply do not see structural social injustice as sin. Now, that's a key concept now in Catholic social teaching, structural social injustice where something is structured into a society that does evil, that brings about evil, structural social injustice. So we need to try to remember those words. And so we simply do not see structural social injustice as sin, feel no responsibility for it, and no obligation to do anything about it. And then they make this contrast. Sunday observance, the church's rules on sex and marriage, tend to enter the Catholic consciousness profoundly as sin. Personal sin, we're very aware of that. And, and we grew up learning about personal sin. I, I speak unkindly about my neighbor. I lash out at somebody, you know, tongue lashing or, or even do violence maybe sometimes, but you know, I, I sin in some personal way, and we're very aware of that. You see, that's when we go to confession, that's what we confess, are those personal failures. And so that was really brought into our awareness. But to live like Dives with Lazarus at the gate is not even perceived as sinful. And they're alluding to that parable that I'm sure all of us remember about the rich person who had everything. Poor beggar at his gate, he walked by him every day, never did anything. The beggar dies, and in the afterlife, the beggar's in the bosom of Abraham, Dives, the rich person's in hell, begging for a drop of water. And Abraham says, look, there's now a chasm between us that cannot be crossed. You could have reached out and touched Lazarus. Now there's no, no connection. It's a very vivid picture. And the bishops are saying, that's what the world looks like. Lazarus is at our gate. 
We have a lot, way more than we have a right to, and we do nothing. If we take that parable seriously, it might jolt us a little bit. I want to expand just a little bit more on that structural social injustice to make sure we understand what we're talking about. Structured social injustice is, happens when some level of society is organized in such a way that it works to the detriment or does evil to individuals or groups within the society. And, and our society is organized at various levels. We have cities, we have states, we have a nation, we have community of nations, different groupings of nations, we have the whole international community. And it's all organized economically. Or if you want a clear example of structured social injustice where a society was organized in such a way that it did, did evil, brought about detriment to individuals or groups. Think about South Africa before Nelson Mandela, South Africa under apartheid. There was a society, a whole nation, organized, deliberately organized, they wrote a constitution that deprived the majority of the people of economic and political rights. It was organized deliberately to exclude the majority of the people from participating in any kind of just way in that nation. They had not enough food, education, clean water, health care, none of the things you needed. See, and they organized it. They wrote a constitution in 1948. And it, it continued that way until finally apartheid was dismantled under the leadership of Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress with help from other nations in the world by putting economic pressure on, on South Africa. And it, so it broke down, it changed. Now you have a free society where everybody has full human rights. It hasn't, you know, the wealth is still badly distributed because you can't undo 40 or 50 years of injustice just overnight. But at least it's all, it's moving in the right direction now. See, that's structural social injustice. We build into our system certain structures that are evil. In our own country, Think of minimum wage laws. We're finally, after many years now, changing the minimum wage. It was $5.25, which meant that a person working full time, 40 or 50 weeks a year, 40 hours a week, would be making less than $11,000 in our country. Now we're, over a period of three years, we're gonna raise it in segments to $7.25. But that's still only going to be $14,300 to somebody working full time. That's below the poverty level. We structure it in such a way that a person can work and work very hard. And there are many, many people working many hours full time getting less than the minimum wage in this country. That's structured social injustice. We build up a law and it does evil to people or brings about evil for people in people's lives. 0.1 billion, that number of garments made in Jordan entered the US duty free last year. So they could be sold in this country at relatively low cost, no tariffs. Here's what happens, the people making these garments that we buy inexpensively. Seven day work weeks are routine with one at most two days off each month. People working in these sweatshops are commonly beaten. Workers are shoved, slapped, and punched for making mistakes or for falling behind in production or using the bathroom too often. 
Workers asking for back wages owed them have been imprisoned. Housed under primitive dorm, con dorm conditions, eight to 10 people sharing each 10 foot by 10 foot room, sleeping in narrow metal double level bunk beds. The dorms lack running water up to three and four days a week, making it impossible to bathe. The stench of the bathrooms is unbearable. Corporate codes of conduct and audits are completely meaningless. Many workers say they feel like slaves. Some workers are trying to escape, leaving their passports behind, hiding by day and running by night in an attempt to cross the border out of Jordan. Now, all of that's taken out of the New York Times article, and it just points out, just scratches the surface of an explosive new 160-page report released on this particular day by the National Labor Committee here in the United States. Who benefits from that kind of situation? Well, of course, the, we do. We buy those goods at uh, low cost, and, so, uh, and, and the corporations that run those sweatshops are based here in the United States. It's Walmart, for one. They have the sweatshops in Jordan, as they have in many other parts of the world. And so we keep getting richer and richer. Those people get poorer and poorer. Here's something that was in the paper uh, on Friday, October 13th, just a, uh, about a week ago. It, on the front page, I don't know how many of us would notice, China drafts a law to empower unions and end labor abuse. In the government of China, they're getting, as this article points out, China is planning to adopt a new law that seeks to crack down on sweatshops and protect workers' rights by giving labor unions real power for the first time since it introduced market forces in the 1980s. The move, which underscores the government's growing concern about the widening income gap and threats of social unrest, in China, they're concerned because they're getting a situation where a few people are getting very rich, and you no, know, they have over a billion people in that country, and the majority of them are desperately poor, and they're afraid of social upheaval. So now they're finally trying to put some justice into the workshops. But look what's happening. It's setting off a battle with U.S. and other foreign corporations that have lobbied against it by hinting that they may, may build fewer factors there. The proposed rules are being considered after the Chinese Communist Party endorsed a new doctrine that will put greater emphasis on tackling the severe side effects of the country's remarkable growth. Whether the foreign corporations will follow through on their warnings is unclear because of the many advantages of being in China, even with restrictions and higher costs that may stem from the new law. But isn't it ironic? Here, finally, China is trying to put in a law to bring about some justice. Who fights the law? The corporations from the United States and Europe. They don't want to pay fair wages. And so people are forced to continue to live in poverty. And, and it's dire poverty. The ones that get jobs in those wet shops are, and continue to be very poor. The people that can't even get those jobs are in absolute poverty. That's what we mean by structured social injustice. And these are the kinds of things that have to be changed. We must begin to dismantle the structures of injustice and build a society where there is justice. Now, now I can't give you tonight specifics on every way that we can do that, but one of the ways that we can is to work against these so-called free trade agreements that are being set up between, like we have NAFTA, North American Free Trade Act, that was put in force with Mexico, Canada, and the United States back in 1994. But recently, we just passed, and was by one vote in the Congress, a Central American Free Trade Act, where the same thing happens, where we set up structures that allow sweatshops to happen. We get cheap goods brought into this country, Corporations make lots of money, we buy the, the cheap goods, but it's off the backs of the poor people. Uh, when the Central American Free Trade Act was before the Congress, a bishop from 
Guatemala came to the United States to testify. And he, he's, in this article about Bishop Rambazzini, people who wonder why there is such passionate opposition to the Central American Free Trade Act, an expansion of the 1993 North American Free Trade Act, need look no further than the decade of results of NAFTA in Mexico. That Free Trade Act displaced one and a half million Mexican peasant farmers. Many of these displaced farmers sought industrial jobs, causing Mexican wages to drop by 20%. Communities and families were torn asunder as those who lost their livelihoods undertook the perilous journey to the United States in hopes of finding some way to support their family. And so we have these people traveling up from Mexico, Central America, entering our country. Now we're building a wall to keep them out. But why are they coming? Because we've established these free trade acts that deprive them of the opportunity for just wages. In Mexico, the people were driven off the land because we forced a change in the Mexican constitution so that farmland that was held, small plots of land held by individuals and families could be sold and consolidated into huge corporate farms. And so the people who were doing the farming before are pushed off. Now it's corporate farming like we have in the United States. And so those people are left without work. They travel this way. We try to push them away. It's a very unjust system, obviously. But instead of looking at the reasons why the immigrants keep coming, we just simply try to push them back or we allow them to work in this country illegally and then they don't have to be paid a just wage. If they want to complain, they know they'll be sent back so they can't complain. They have to take whatever is given to them. These are structured social injustices. And in a general way, what I need to emphasize is simply that what has to happen is that all of us, if we really want to carry out our commitments to carry on the work of Jesus, to transform our world into the reign of God where justice will happen, then we have to begin to be alert to what's going on through our government policies, through our economic policies, and, and work for just policies. See, we should be demanding that a fair minimum wage be accorded to every worker in this country, that wage laws be enforced in other countries or we won't trade with them, instead of corporations trying to prevent just laws from happening in China or places like that. We have to begin to be aware of how our public policy enacted through our Congress or through other mechanisms like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, how those policies build up structures of injustice. We have to work to change them. One other uh, thing, that, that is, is uh, I think the most important thing to try to become aware of social uh, injustices that happen because of structures of injustice. But there, there's another uh, angle that we have to be aware of, and that is simply the fact that we have too much, and we need to find ways to share our excess uh, wealth that, that we have in this country. I'm trying to find a passage from a document of Pope Paul, but I know it. I can give it to you. In, in 1967, Pope Paul VI wrote an encyclical letter called On the Development of Peoples. I mentioned it before. It's one of the most passionate encyclicals you'll ever read. He wrote it with great emotion. He had, shortly before that, had been to India and had traveled to Calcutta where Mother Teresa worked. And he went into that slum area and he was very emotionally moved, as any one of us would be. If you get into one of these places where people are in absolute poverty, it's overwhelming. I remember seeing a picture in the newspaper at the time uh, where 
Paul VI was shown there in the slum area of Calcutta, where you know, there's no street, it's just mud uh, roads and sewage and dirty water. And he's standing there in his white cassock and it's splattered with mud and sewage. And it shows tears coming down his cheeks. He's standing there weeping, just overwhelmed because your heart goes out to those people, but you feel helpless. The only thing you can do is weep. He did. Then when he came back, he wrote this encyclical on the development of peoples. In the patent, passage, paragraphs 22 and 23, he speaks about the unjust situation of the distribution of wealth in the world. And, and he says, coming from the Vatican Council, we, and he cites the passage where the bishops say that God intended the world for all, not for a few. And that's a very basic principle. God intended the world for all, and not for a few. And then he goes on to say, to draw from scriptures, and he draws from the letter of St. John. He said, how can the love of God abide in anyone who sees a brother or sister in need and closes your heart to that person. How can the love of God abide in you? Then he quotes uh, the early teachers of the church, and he mentions St. Ambrose specifically. He says, Ambrose taught us that what God has given for all, you have arrogated to yourself. And so when you give to the poor, you're not giving what belongs to you, you're giving what belongs to them. See, that's an attitude that I don't think most of us have, that when we give to the poor, we're giving what belongs to them. Why? And here's where then Paul draws forth a, a principle that's very challenging, very hard to live by, but we, I think, have to try to modify our own lifestyles. He says, no one has a right to keep for your own use what is beyond your need when others lack the barest necessities. No one has a right to keep for your own use what is beyond your need when others lack the barest necessities. Probably every one of us in this church right now has more than we need. We accumulate material goods. It's almost impossible not to in the society in which we live. Advertising keeps pushing new things on us. We keep are being encouraged all the time to uh, respond to artificial needs. Not real needs, artificial needs that are created. And, and we give in, and so we accumulate. We have more than we need. And uh, so we have to, in some way, change our lifestyle so that we're not uh, using up the goods of the world uh, for ourselves and neglecting the poor. Um, which means that to some, in some ways we have to find out how to live more simply. And one of the parts of Catholic social teaching that Pope John Paul II emphasized was what was happening to the environment. And those, these things get connected. See, as we use up more of the world's goods and keep on accumulating excessive material goods, we're destroying the very environment of our planet. We cannot continue to sustain the lifestyle that we have, especially as China, with over one billion people, begins to try to imitate our lifestyle, which they're trying to do, India, with over a billion people trying to live our lifestyle, the world cannot continue to be treated this way. We're, we're destroying the very environment that gives us any of the wealth that we have. And so even from a kind of a self-interest, we need to change, in some ways, our individual lifestyle. So those are the two things that we need to do, I believe, if we're going to respond to 
the message of Jesus. We need to work to undo unjust structures. And we need to change our own way of life in some way. And then as we change our way of life, share more of what we have with others. Those two things together will enable us to be faithful to the call that Jesus gives us to carry on his work. This day, this scripture passage is fulfilled even as you listen. And Jesus, again, I remind us, proclaiming good news for the poor, giving the blind new sight, healing the brokenhearted, setting the downtrodden free, proclaiming God's year of favor. We all must join in this work of Jesus to make our world what God wants it to be, the reign of God, where every person has a chance for a full human life. You know, there are over one billion Christians in the world. Now, over one billion Christians. Suppose all of us who say we follow Jesus began to carry out his work. The reign of God could happen and will happen when all of us do that. But it starts with each one of us. And so I hope when you leave here tonight, you're more committed than ever to carry on the work of Jesus to make the reign of God happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. There is time for just a couple of questions if you want, and then I won't be racing out of here right away. So if we don't answer questions publicly, we can still chat afterwards. See, that, it's part of the, the thrust that's been within the church where we put so much focus on what we would call individual morality and not enough on social morality. And so the bishops of Michigan, it wasn't just the archdiocese, all the bishops of Michigan joined in that effort because they saw that as a very important um, moral question. And so they did use a half a million dollars resources on that one issue that was not necessary because it was already state law. And, the, and so it was to change and make it a constitutional, a part of the Constitution, which wasn't necessary. And yet, because that personal moral question got so much attention, the bishops responded that way. It, to me, it's, it's um, a failure on the part of the bishops themselves to hear the very message that comes from the Catholic social teachings that flow from the Vatican Council, flow from the documents of 1967, 1971, 1984, the different encyclical letters. And it's, it's just another example of how we put emphasis on personal morality and fail to put nearly as much or even anything adequate for trying to change the social structures. So, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I don't justify it, but that's how it happens. It's just that emphasis that's still within our church. Question. The question is, you know, when the World Series starts next Saturday, the civil authorities in Detroit are going to find ways to get the poor people out of sight. <laughs> and they won't necessarily put them in shelters or anything, but they'll somehow try to get them so downtown looks better. Well. You know, that's just because the citizens of Detroit and this larger metropolitan community don't object to it, and they let it happen. And so we have to protest that kind of thing. And, and the best thing, though, would be not just to be negative against what they're doing because of the World Series, but to work for fair housing for all people and you know, an opportunity for everybody to get a decent housing. And, and we need, even now, we still need more low-cost housing so that people who are working on a minimum wage 
can live in a, some kind of a decent housing situation. So we, you know, it's one of those things we have to keep working on to change. Low cost housing is a public policy issue that comes up, you know, when you're talking to your congressperson or they're trying to get your vote right now, ask them what they're doing, uh, you know, on a national level to bring about um, money for low cost housing for poor parts, not just in cities, but in rural areas also. And this is a time when we can take our moral concerns and bring them into the public arena because people are looking for your vote. And so hold them to you know, questions like that. When this issue of pro-life comes up, we have to, I, I think, be um, insightful. <laughs> I'll put it that way. See, sometimes candidates that talk a lot of pro-life, um, and mainly they talk about changing the Constitution, you know, that we've been trying to do since 1972. It's not going to happen. It hasn't happened, and it almost certainly is not going to happen. And yet we spend lots of time, lots of money, lots of energy trying to do that. And which means that you know, individual states will be making laws about this, and they are now, and they keep getting passed on to the Supreme Court. But you can be pro-life in other ways and, and I'm talking here about abortion. During the eight years of President Clinton, there were fewer abortions than there were during the term of President Reagan or the two terms of Reagan, during the term of the first President Bush, and during the term of the second President Bush. Why? Because there was a safety net for the poor. When that safety net was dismantled, abortions went up. And so if we really care about life, we have to make it possible that poor people don't feel forced into getting abortions. And ultimately, we need to come to a consensus in this country about uh, at what point we need to totally outlaw uh, the killing of uh, unborn life. So we, we have to come to consensus that we haven't done it. But in the meantime, if we really want to be pro-life, pro then we have to keep on trying to find ways to reduce the number of abortions till we get to the point where it's zero, which I hope it would get to. But that's going to depend on individual morality more than social morality, because it's always the individual choice when abortions happen, but sometimes it's under that pressure of economic deprivation. And so if we can make the situation better, there'll be fewer abortions. And so to say that you're going to vote for somebody just because that candidate says he or she will uh, change the Constitution uh, and eliminate Roe v. Wade, uh, it that isn't going to happen. So look for candidates that are going to be very serious about finding ways to reduce the number of abortions and gradually make it something that would be unacceptable in this society and unnecessary from the point of view of people who think it's necessary because they just feel caught. You know, a person just cannot afford another child. And if you had a just society, that situation would be gone. And then it would become down to the personal morality and we'd have to keep on trying to persuade people abortion is wrong. And, and that, you know, again, that's, I think, part of the failure of the church. It's tragic that you know, a country like Poland has one of the highest abortion rates in the world. Now that's a very Catholic Christian country. Why haven't we persuaded our own people 
And so we really have to work hard within our Catholic community to teach the morality of, about human life and from you know, the very beginning. And so that should be a major emphasis. And then again, trying to make a situation where people will not feel desperate about needing the abortion. So that would be a much more pro-life approach, it seems to me. Okay, uh, I think I'll call it, and um, we can still gather around a little bit if you wish, but I appreciate very much this opportunity to be with you, and I thank you for your very kind response to my presence here tonight. So. Okay, thank you.